Okay, back. This is uh, Springfield Johnny. Got my uh, other glasses on so you can see my blue eyes because I'll get the reflection of the screen there. They kind of look funny. They look like some kind of uh, robotron or something, you know, reflection of the screen and my glasses. So I'm going to take a look at my pretty blue. So i got to tell you, Meeting Les McCann was a highlight of my life, one of them, because I was out of my element. I, I took a big risk. You know, go, we had to go to Maryland, go see her, her hippest, coolest friend she's ever had, besides Kenny Reed, who she married, by the way. And uh, he's a drummer, he's a black man. And, uh, but I'm going up to the Hollywood Hills, and we took the bus up there. Took up the number three Blue Bluffs on Santa Monica. And I remember there was a, I said, I said, I'm 16 years old. Marilyn's all dressed up. She just looks so sexy and beautiful. Her hair could get really wavy and blonde like this. And she just looks like, you know, Veronica Lake. Or all of them, she looked like a, a starlet. And there was this guy about 26 years old. He's just in the back of the bar. He couldn't get his eyes off her. He's just like, look at that one. Whoa. Oh, no. <laughs> Why? Why did I have her? I'm going, shit. What were you looking at, dude? You know, I might have to come over there and fight you in the back of the bus. You know? And you, you look somewhere else. Don't still be looking at my girl. And Marilyn like, yeah, you don't know, you don't care. You know, she she knows. You know, see this. She we, 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 we women got these highlights in their life. They never talk about them. See, I've known Marilyn since I don't know what going on fifty years, and I gotta plow the store the stores out of here like oh like teeth. It's like pulling teeth with her. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, did it? Yeah. I, oh, did I tell you about the time? I know. You know, I told you I brought the book. You know, you, you, you know, you don't tell me this stuff until I, until I, you know, work it out of you. You know. So she said, you know, this is high drama for her. She said a whole meeting, you know. Very cathartic, you know. She's got her uh, sister's now living in Paris, and uh, just her and her mom, the brother, I had a good talk about Stanley, he, uh, he's out in the shed there with, with a bunch of beatniks from Venice, you know, the pot smoke coming out of the little shed, <laughs> you know, he opened that door one afternoon and the out there came, you know, you need me to mine and mow. In their cutoffs and their sandals and their long hair with no shirts on, tan as could be. These are real, real Venice beatniks. You know, came out all the world, in the middle of the mall, right out of that shit. So, uh, okay, so, you know, whatever she thought about this, this young man that was just taking her in, he was eating her like eye candy. Oh, she said, oh, that's good. You know, that's my good-looking boyfriend. Now we're going to go up and see my cool friend, Les McCann. She's, this is, you know, this is a highlight. This is a highlight. <laughs> you know, see, women live for these things. See, they never talk about it. You know, but see, I'm, this is the first time, see. I tried to get her feeling. Well, what did you think about that? That may... That dude looking at you, that young man looking at you, oh, nothing. You know, yeah, right. So, I am looking at this picture window, and I say, see, look at that. It's just like out of a book, a movie. There's a lights of Los Angeles, Hollywood Boulevard down there, Sunset Strip, you know, Sunset Boulevard, right down there. Reach down this big picture, and it would be a huge thing. And there's Les playing with piano, 
There's Maryland looking so beautiful. I said, I can't believe this. I can't believe I got this beautiful woman in my life, the young woman, you know. I can't believe that she does such cool people. Now, now I know that she. And uh, there's less, you know. And all of a sudden he stops, see. The song's over and he looking at me. He leans over and he says, you see my finger there? He says, you better take good care of my little girl here, or you got to answer to me. You hear? This is what he did. That's, you know, I want to get that, that finger in there, you know. That's a famous finger that was playing the 88s over there in Montrose, you know, Switzerland, you know. Swiss clock, and he's pointing right at me, you know. You better make sure you take care of my little girl here. You're going to have to answer to me. Well, I'm going, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? You know, I'm from Oakland. You know, it's the Oakland Johnny here. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to take this shit. You know? But I, you know? And Marilyn's just, you know? Her peripheral vision, her peripheral vision. She's checking it all out, pretending not to notice. You know that that I don't like people pointing, <laughs> figure at me, telling me what to do. No. So so we leave, and she's all like, you know, won't talk to me, all the huffing. You know, I go, what's wrong? You know. She says. You know what's wrong, you know. You, you don't like my friend Les, but she's a black man. I said, no, that's not true, you know. I just don't like him pointing his finger at me, telling me he's going to kick my ass if I do <laughs> We still argue over this, see. It, you know, today, 50 years later, you know, you know, how prejudiced did I actually feel in reality? I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. You know, how prejudiced really did was I feeling that that evening, you know? Did my true, you know, racist, redneck self come out right there in front of my beautiful little young girl? My girlfriend, my first girlfriend, you know? I don't like him say that's his little girl. That ain't his little girl. You get off it, Les, I tell you. You know, you, you and I got to have a talk someday. He you ain't your girl. She's just your friend. You know, so all the way home on, on, the, on the number three bus, you know, she Marilyn ain't talking to me, you know, because, you know, you, you got the racist meter, see, you know, there just to be the low end of the meter, you know, just be the middle of it, and just be the top of it, see, you know, and I'm thinking I'm maybe down here, but she thinks I'm way up here, and I'm, and I'm way off the, off the chart with my racism, you know. Boy, did that really come out. Yeah, Les really brought the worst out of me, you know. So I know we were taking, you know, she's riding on the bus, number three blue bus on Santa Monica, you know. You know. She's, well, where's that handsome man I saw earlier? You know, I wish she'd come back. Maybe he'll he'll get on on the next stop. Because I'm, I'm going to flirt with him. I show, I show Johnny. You know, he he, he got to tone down that racism. I guess we ain't, we through. <laughs> so, life, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so I get sober, right, in 1987. And, and, and my niece Shannon when I talked to my my let me do this. When my new Shannon, we heard a, we heard a message, Facebook message. She says, you know, I, I really like that tower you lived in in Oakland. I said, you know about that tower? Yeah, I was there. Uncle, Uncle Johnny, I was there in that tower. You were in that tower? Do you know where that tower was, little girl? My niece said, she says, how the hell did you get over there in that tower? She says, oh, yeah, I don't know. Came visit you. Who? Who did you, who did you come with? 
No, how did that, you know, no, no. That towers off limits to, to white people except me. I'm the only white, white man that could live in that neighborhood and live. She says, no, I was there. You know? And this is what's so hard about getting sober. I talk about it all the time at the meeting. You, should, you miss your life. You know? And, uh, I had a bad life. Couldn't get any better than life. I was living in Oakland before I got sober. I, I, you know, I lived in the crack neighborhood. I lived in the premier crack neighborhood of Oakland with a gang of crack dealers and prostitutes that I knew when they were children. Little children. They were just this high. When I, when I lived in the, in the the, the complex apartment next to the tower, I fixed it up. I was there helping a friend fix it up. And I had the, these little kids over that lived in the neighborhood. They were helping me mud, you know, get get them the mud and knife out, put some mud on there, and they, you know, teach them how to bring the line down. And I bring, you know, they put the tape up. I have them hold the tape and bring the knife down. We were doing some mud. These kids are six, seven, eight years old, and they loved it, you know, and I paid them. I paid them a couple of dollars, and then on Saturday, they'd come over, and they'd have some cheer-ups, and we'd watch some cartoons together, and these were my friends, and uh, so I finished that job, and I, you know, came back about five, six years, seven years later, they were all grown up. Dad was and I went into in the water tower. They made it into a place to live. They had the first floor and the bedroom up on top there. And I had the kitchen and everything down below. I loved that place. So Shannon she thought that's the coolest place she's ever seen anybody live in. And uh, next door. <laughs> These little girls, they're all grown up. They, well, they ain't that grown up, but they're doing tricks. They, they rented departments, two of them, and they're doing tricks all 24-7, you know? And, and, and there's their, the boys I knew. They're out there on the corner selling crack, and, and, and they're my friends still, see, you know? And, and, and I, you know, I had a black girlfriend named Venus to me. They were better over there at the Bartolas. Italian, Italian food place right down the street, around the corner. And from five, let's see, four, five in the afternoon to seven, eight o'clock at night, you could buy a well drink for 10 cents. I said, man, I'm in heaven. I mean, I'm, look at me, I'm living in, you know, the, the, the most notorious crack neighborhood in Oakland. I got this great bar right in the corner, I don't, you know, that sells my drinks for 10 cents. I says, this, this is it, you know. And I, you know, I don't got to drive, see. I don't, you know, you know, I, when I come out of Bartola's at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know. I don't gotta drive. I'm not gonna get in my car and you know have be be susceptible to some Oakland cops. He, he pulled me over. I say they they know Oakland Johnny. You know I got a DUI before, so I don't know if these glasses are working. Let's try this. Get that glare off, you know. So you know there I, there I am I'm stumbling, you know out of the bar told us that. Two o'clock in the morning, walking home, weaving home, through the most dangerous crack neighborhood in the world, you know, really. You know, I got no problem. Like nobody gonna be mugging me. Because I know all the muggers. <laughs> I'm a member of the hood. Now I remember I come out of there, come out of my home, wake up in the morning, and I walk out and there's a car burned out there. Someone firebombed the car. And I said, shit, you know, there was the leader. I said, you guys are really blowing it here, you know. 
and he looked at me. He says, "You know, don't worry, old Contrani. We, we, you, we, you know, you're a member of the hood. We take care of you. We will make sure nothing happened to you." Oh, I said, "Really? You're gonna make sure nothing happened to me, huh?" Well, thanks. You no. Know? <laughs> I called up. Michael Dunn and I said, "You got to get me out of here because I think I'm a dead man. I think of the, I think I'm going to be coming home drunk one night, and someone's going to hit me on the side of the head, really hard, and they're going to take my wallet, and uh, you know, I have a big bandage on my head. See, and I'll be like half brain dead. I don't, you know, I don't even know who my relatives are no more. You know, and." Uh, I don't got the sense enough to move out of there, you know. I got my towel, I got my coolers, I got my bandage on my head, you know. Oh yeah, my nose is all broken to the side. Well, got a laceration here from the next mug and I take, you know. Oh yeah, something slashed him across the neck with a razor, you know. I said, I was, you know, I'm out there digging in the corner. I'm, I'm gonna plant the, the April or summer. The April spring gone. I'm gonna put on change the neighborhood. So I'm out there digging. Damn! I take the weeds out, and there's like six or seven hypodermic needles there. You know, there I'm. You know, I, I can fall back. I just, you know, I says I'm gonna die here. I'm taking my own grave. I'm taking my own grave. I says. I gotta get out of here. This is, this is bottom. Now back to Venus. She was a beautiful woman, a beautiful woman. And she was a prostitute. And uh, my friend Sparka come over to visit me. He come down there. Sparka uh, was a student of Kung Fu. Right down on 13th Street in downtown Oakland, Chinatown. And he took me in there one day. He said, This is the baddest Kung Fu place in America. These people can kick your ass. They kick my ass. I got bruised ribs every day. I fight like hell. I'm the only white boy who takes class from one of the greatest Kung Fu masters in the world. And Sparky was like my brother. His mother was my second mother. So one afternoon, you know, we we went to Patola's house some drink with Venus. And in comes her pimp. This guy. Ooh, way up. Better look at this guy. You know. He got muscles out to hair. You know, this is the biggest, baddest black man I've seen. Ever. And he started giving Venus some shit. And, uh. She was looking at the turbine. You know, why don't you just, you know, man, you get the leave me alone. Yeah. And also Michael looked up to each other, you know, why don't you just take off and disappear? Why don't you just go disappear yourself? Get out of this woman's face. And uh he kind of did this, you know, and then, okay, all right, okay, that's the life I lived, every day I didn't know whether I was going to live or die, people put guns on me, pulled the trigger and the gun went fire, So when I'm three years sober, four years sober, I got my Cadillac going back up to Eugene. I'm homesick. I'm a 
homesick like uh, days of wine and roses. I, I don't know how I made it. I don't know how I made it. I've got 32 years sober today. And every day I think that I'd, I'd be dead. That day I chose not to have another drink. And that day I chose to get out of Oakland. It was the heaviest duty day of my life. Trust me on that. Okay, this is Springfield Jordan. I want you to be safe out there, you hear? And don't you be getting in your car after you've been in the bar. I would just come over there and kick your ass. Yeah.